As it's already been read, my focus, my passage, Philippians 1, 5, fellowship in the gospel. One of the things that I think of when I think of this passage, and I'm not going to sing to you, you'd all leave if I did that, <laughs> but leaning on the everlasting arms, that ties right in with this, this passage. And you're very familiar with the words. Uh, this is one of my favorite hymns. What a fellowship, what a joy divine, leaning on the everlasting arms. What a blessedness, what a peace is mine, leaning on the everlasting arms. Oh, how sweet to walk in this pilgrim way, leaning on the everlasting arms. Oh, how bright the path grows from day to day, leaning on the everlasting arms. What have I to dread? What have I to fear? Leaning on the everlasting arms. I have blessed peace with my Lord so near, leaning on the everlasting arms. And then the chorus, leaning, leaning, leaning on the everlasting arms. Are we thankful for Christ? in his arms that we can lean on. As I thought about this topic, a couple of statements that I hope capture the focus of this fellowship in the gospel. It is divine fellowship of participation. I want to emphasize that word participation. It's not something we do passively, but we participate in this fellowship. And it is a participation in God himself. We're participating in him. We're participating in Christ. We're participating in the Holy Spirit. We're participating in their kingdom. We've been called into their kingdom. And later on I'll, I'll uh, talk a little more about that. But the second statement, we are partakers partakers of God, Christ, and the Holy Spirit and their word. And that's very important, I think, to keep in mind here when we think of this topic, fellowship in the gospel, in the good news. It's a very active, present experience of our salvation that we have in Christ. So, so always remember that, keep that in mind. Philippians chapter 1, verses 3 through 11. Uh, I want to take some time and look at, at that just a little bit this morning as we consider this topic. First thing Paul says in verse 3 that, that uh, catches my attention is he says, I thank my God. I thank my God upon every remembrance of you, always in every prayer of mine making request for for you all with joy for your fellowship in the gospel from the first day until now being confident of this very thing that he who has begun a good work in you will complete it until the day of Jesus Christ just as it is right for me to thank this of all of you because I have you in my heart inasmuch as both in my chains and in the defense and confirmation of the gospel, you all are partakers with me of grace. For God is my witness, how I greatly long for you all with the affection of Christ. And this I pray, that your love may abound still more and more in knowledge and all discernment, that you may approve of the things that are excellent, that you may be sincere and without offense, Till the day of Christ, being filled with the fruits of righteousness, which are by Jesus Christ, to the glory and the praise of God. When I think about this passage, I ask myself, because when Paul writes this letter, 
It's about 10 years later after he had been there on a second missionary journey there at Philippi, and uh, we'll get into that also here in a little bit in Acts 16. But he, he is uh, thanking God for their growth. They have continued in this fellowship in the gospel. They have progressed forward, and that has been spoken of uh, yesterday. It's been spoken of this morning by Brother uh, Boyce already. But it caused within him this, this wanting to pray. He says, always in every prayer of mine, making requests for you all with joy. It created joy <coughs> Excuse me, in uh, the Apostle Paul. Uh, one of the things that I... <clears throat> that I see here in this letter, uh, and we see this in some of the other letters he writes, but particularly here, we see his heart. He had a special, special uh, connection with the saints. And if you back up to verse 1, they're called saints. Anybody in Christ is a saint. Uh, and he had this special connection with them and this love and who knows how much he prayed for him daily 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 i'm sure and it's because he he could see their growth now this isn't something just that took place in the first century and i want to make that point also this is right now this is a present day experience uh, this is something that, that we too, I, I hope, experience, <laughs> this fellowshipping in the gospel of good news, in this salvation that's been purchased by Christ, given to us by Christ, uh, by God. Now, he's praying for them with all joy. Acts 16 gives us the background and in a little bit, I, I will go to that and spend some time looking at that. But I want you to notice something that is mentioned in verse 5. From the first day until now. When he was with them about 10 years earlier, that's the first day. If, you, if you're familiar with Acts 16, that Macedonian call, that vision that Paul had, and they... Uh, Realize this is from the Lord. They were wanting to go to Asia, but the Holy Spirit had forbidden them. Acts 19, guess where they get to go? They do get to go to Asia, but there was something more important. Come over here and help us. And one of the things to remember about fellowshipping in the gospel that we can learn from the Apostle Paul is that we very, very tenderly listen to the guiding of the Holy Spirit. They weren't like, well, maybe we shouldn't go. <laughs> maybe we shouldn't uh, go over to Macedonia. No, they went to Macedonia. That was one of the foremost cities of Macedonia, Philippi was. So, so keep that in mind. Now, another thing to note here, verse 6. Paul was confident of this very thing, he says. And here's what he's confident of that he, God, who has begun a good work in them or in you, will complete it until the day of Jesus Christ. Fellowshipping in the gospel is a work of God. He's working in each one of us. That's why we're here, I hope, this week, is because God is working in our lives. And Paul had a confidence in this. He had a boldness in this. Because Paul understood how God operated. And, and in our own lives, we need to have that same confidence. You know, I, I thought about this uh, passage here, and I thought, you know, a church that starts, God raises it up, and then 10 years later, are there people that was involved in the, the raising up of that church, God using them? Would they say the same thing? I thank my God in every remembrance of you, making requests for you with all joy, 
noting that your fellowship in the gospel from the first day until now is continuing on. A lot of churches need to look at this and, and evaluate where they're at. I won't get in, that's a whole other subject, <laughs> leave that alone. But verse 7, Paul says, and note this, he says, it is right, it's right for Paul to think this of them. It's right, because God is working here. God is working in their lives. And it's right for us to think this if we think this about other saints. There's nothing wrong with, with being confident about God working in somebody's life. Sometimes, some people that I talk to, it's like, well, I, I don't know. We, we can be confident. Now, notice this in verse 7. Paul's saying it is right, as I mentioned earlier, but why? He says this, because I have you in my heart. Earlier I mentioned about how uh, the Apostle Paul had a very close connection. He had them in his heart. And he goes on and saying, as much as both in my chains, because he was in prison writing this letter. He'd been put in prison. So in his chains and the defense and the confirmation of the gospel. And then he notes this. You are all partakers with me of grace. Partakers of grace. This is God's grace that teaches us to deny ungodliness. It teaches us to keep our focus on the Lord, to look <clears throat> to, look to him, uh, to put our, our whole complete faith in him. And then in verse 8 here, he says, For God is my witness. I tell you, I like that when that's mentioned in Scripture. What Paul's doing here is he's... He's calling God to the witness stand. God's my witness. How greatly I long for you all with the affection of Jesus Christ. We want to know what the affection of Christ is? Well, think about what he's done. Not just done for us, but did for God. God needed someone to come and save us. That's, we're the byproduct of this, but God needed someone to, to come that was perfect, and that's Christ. He looked around. Isaiah talks about this. He, God looked around. There was no one. So his own right arm came and brought salvation. Christ brought salvation. So we see the affection of Christ. We see how deeply Christ loves God and loves us by what he, he, he did here on the earth. He came and he lived. He never sinned. And I know we all know this, but it's always a good reminder for us to, to be refreshed in this. He never sinned. He lived perfectly in union with the Father even having a fleshly body. Can any of us say that in being equal to Christ? That we, we can't. All have sinned and fallen short of the glory of God. That's why we need Christ. So, so we see in Christ this great love. And then Paul talks about his prayer life. One of the things that I've noted over the years when I read the epistles of the Apostle Paul as the Holy Spirit has, has directed him, we learn a lot about how to pray and what to say in our prayers when we take and look at each one of these letters. And in the rest of the verses left here, 8, 9, 10, and 11, <clears throat> we find out about the praying of Paul. And he says this, And this I pray, that your love may abound still more and more in knowledge and all discernment. 
Let us pray that for one another. <laughs> Let us pray that for one another. We always need someone praying for us that our love may abound still more and more in knowledge and all discernment. We never get to the point where we don't need any more knowledge of Christ, any more knowledge of God. We, we need more and more. Was it yesterday, I think, we, we uh, sung the hymn, More About Jesus? I love that hymn. We should uh, always, and, and I know here in this group we, we have this desire, but we should always be wanting to, to, to hear more about Jesus, experience more about Jesus. This, this fellowship in the gospel, it, it's a life that we've been given. It's the life that Christ has given to us. It's very important. And then discernment. More than any other time in our society, we need discernment. We need discernment. The enemy, the devil, his workers, they're very subtle. They're very subtle. And we need discernment. And the only way to get that discernment is that we are fellowshipping in the gospel fellowshipping with God, fellowshipping with Christ, fellowshipping in the Holy Spirit, being in the Word, being around, like being here this week. This helps us to be more discerning because we, we are here this week. <coughs> and then he goes on in verse 10 and he says this, that you may approve the things that are excellent. We need to pray this for one another. We need to pray that each one of us would approve the things that are excellent. The things that are excellent about God, which is everything, <laughs> and Christ, and the Holy Spirit, and the Word of God, even the things that are excellent as the Lord works in our own lives. There's a lot of excellent things that we do in Christ. And, and that's important to, to remember. And we need to approve those things. Where honor is due, honor should be given. Now we have to always be careful about this because we don't want to get prideful about it. But because of Christ in our life, we can do very, very, and various things very excellent. Because it's he who works in us. So it's very important. We're yoked with him. His yoke is light. It's not burdensome. We're, and he's working right there alongside of us. We're drawing from his power. He's not drawing from any kind of power we have. But we're drawing from his power. And then the next thing that is mentioned in this prayer. This is uh, in verse 10 that you may be sincere and without offense till the day of Christ. That's very important also. We always need someone, we need people, other brethren praying for us that we would be sincere and without offense. That should be our deep desire to never offend Christ, God, the Holy Spirit, the brethren, or, or anybody. And this is, this being without offense is to be until the day of Christ. Until Jesus comes. Until he gathers his church together, his, his brethren together to present us to God. Uh, those of you that have listened to me in the past, I love that thought and that idea that Christ is going to gather us together and he's going to present us as the church to the Father. And we're going to be without spot. Amen. We're going to be without wrinkle. We're going to be perfect. We're going to be perfect. We're going to be made new. Uh, there in uh, 1 Corinthians 15, we have the, re the resurrection body that's talked about there. It's going to be a body of spiritual power. We're going to be able to, to serve God without any hindrances. We're going to be able to see him in his fullness, the fullness of his glory, the fullness of his, his holiness. 
So we need someone, we need people praying for us that we would be sincere and without offense till the day of Christ. And then verse 11 says this. I added a word here. Hope you don't throw me out for that. <laughs> you are being filled with the fruits of righteousness. As we fellowship in the gospel, we're being filled with these, these just many, 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 many fruits of righteousness. And it's not our own righteousness. You know, we, we, we learn very early on if we're any kind of student of the scriptures that our own righteousness won't get us anywhere. But the righteousness of Christ will get us to God. We're clothed in his righteousness. We've been put, uh, uh, as it says in Isaiah, it talks about robes of salvation being put upon us. Robes of righteousness are also put upon us. And that's what God sees. He sees his own righteousness being put upon us because of Christ and what Christ has done. And we've put our faith in Christ. Now it goes on in verse 11 and it says this. You are being filled with the fruits of righteousness, which are by Jesus Christ, to the glory and the praise of God. This ends in giving glorification and praise to God. If we can't do something and be comfortable with the fact that it's going to bring glory and praise to God, then we need to rethink what we're doing. We really, really do. Because it's not about us. It's not about me. It's not about you, but it's about God. In the end, it's about Him. It's about Christ. It's about the Holy Spirit. It's about their kingdom. Uh, I think it, it was Brother Bob who mentioned yesterday uh, that wonderful... Uh, passage here in Philippians every knee is going to bow and every tongue is going to confess now for us we, we can't wait I mean we're already doing it <laughs> we can't wait until that great day when we get to do that in eternity but I'll tell you the wicked are going to do it too they're going to do it too they're going to bow down before the Lord and they're going to finally realize you know I've made a grave mistake and it's going to cost them eternity they're going to be in the lake of fire for eternity I mean like thinking about that I mean Jesus is pretty vivid about hell the book of Revelation is very vivid about hell the scripture is very clear about hell it's not a good place to be it's a place of torment and it's forever now as we think about this passage for just a little bit I want us to think about Acts 16 Acts 16 is like the foundation of this this is where all of this starts and what I've did is I've come broken up Acts 16 verses 6 through 40 and very quickly I want to summarize it God raises up a church in verse in 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 this passage he raises up a church from among the people there. And I want to emphasize this. I hear a lot of talk today in various circles where people will say, well, we raised up a church. I'm sorry, but that's not what the scriptures teach. Jesus says, I will build my church. We get the privilege to be part of that. He uses us in doing that, but we need to remember it's God who raises up the church. Paul was very clear. One sows the seed and then another waters. That's what we do. And then he brings the increase. He grows the church. You know, in the book of Acts, and this is just kind of a side thing here, but in the book of Acts, several times it talks about how the Lord added to the church. 
<laughs> doesn't say Paul added to the church. doesn't say Peter added to the church. But it says that the Lord himself added to the church. Now, as God raises up this church from among those people there in Macedonia and the city of Philippi, Paul's on his second missionary journey. This is a picture of fellowship in the gospel. We see that in his, Paul's own life and those who are with him at this time. So here in, in verses 6 through 10 of Acts 16, we can see here an example of being led by the Holy Spirit. I mentioned a little bit of this earlier. They were forbidden by the Holy Spirit to preach the word in Asia. And then a vision appears to Paul. Come over to Macedonia and help us. <laughs> Come over here. And verse 10 uses the word immediately. Immediately. When they realized this is what the Lord wanted, they made their way to Macedonia, to Philippi. Next section, Acts 16, verses 11 through 15. I want us to note here, and this is the part where it talks about Lydia's heart being opened up. The Lord opens the hearts of people so they can hear the gospel or heed it, listen to it. The reason each one of us are here today and I hope everyone who's here knows the Lord. If not, uh, I would encourage you to think seriously about that. It, it's something that we all need to do, uh, be, not just because somebody says you need to do it, but because of the love of God for us and how he has, has blessed us. Now, he opens up Lydia's heart. She's able to understand what the Apostle Paul's preaching. And he's preaching the gospel. That's what he's doing. And, and she readily listens to this. And she's baptized. Her and her whole household. It's really a revival taking place. <laughs> you know, that, that's what God does in raising up a church. It's, it's a revival. So he opens up hearts. And we experience this today. I'm sure we could all give testimonies of people we know, and we know that the Lord opened up their heart to listen to the Word of God. I know that's what happened to me many years ago. At that time, I didn't know that's what it was. But as I grew in the Lord, I, oh, this is what this is. <laughs> the Lord opened up my heart so that I could listen to the gospel so that I could come into fellowship with him. <clears throat> then we have here in Acts 16, verses 16 through 24, this section. Here we have the preaching of the gospel, and it brings about persecution of the saints. It does. Paul and Silas end up in jail. <laughs> they end up in prison for preaching the gospel. Very important to note that. We're living in a day and time where very rapidly persecution of the saints is increasing. Here in America, we, we have a little bit of it, but and I'm not trying to be a prophet here, but it's going to get worse. It's going to get worse. There's some big changes coming up, I think, in, in the near future. Some of them have already started, but we need to be ready to be persecuted. We need to be prepared to stand up and give an answer to the faith that we have in Christ Jesus. Very important that we, we are ready to do that. Acts 16, verses 25 through 34. Here we have a fruitful testimony of the working of God in the lives of his saints. Uh, there's many things that are, that are mentioned there, but just think how God worked in their lives there. Uh, it takes some time and read Acts 16. Acts 16 verses 35 through 40. There is like fear among the enemies of Christ. They found out we've arrested Roman citizens. They wanted to just kind of put it over in the corner, shove it to the side, and Paul said, with boldness, he says, no, 
You openly persecuted us and beat us and put us in jail. You come and let us out. And they did, and they went to Lydia's house. Now, verse 40. <clears throat> Before they leave Philippi, Paul and Silas, those who were traveling with him, they went to the brethren and they encouraged them. When we're fellowshipping in the gospel, that's what takes place. We go to the brethren, and there's encouragement, edification that takes place. Now, one of the things uh, that goes along with this topic, and I just want to note these passages. Never forget in 1 Corinthians 1, 9, it says that God calls us into the fellowship of his son, Jesus Christ our Lord. It's a fellowship that we've been called into. It's a, a walking with the Lord, using an Old Testament term. You know, it talks about how Noah walked with the Lord or Enoch walked with the Lord. Uh, that's what we're doing. We're walking uh, with the Lord himself. And then 1 Corinthians chapter 10, verse 16, talks about the cup of blessing and the bread we break. That is, depending on what translation of the scriptures you use, it'll say either communion or fellowship. When we partake of the Lord's Supper, it's a fellowshipping. It's a communion. So, so keep, that, <coughs> keep that in mind. 2 Corinthians 8.4 talks about the fellowship of the ministering to the saints. And that can be done in various and many ways throughout the scriptures. <coughs> Excuse me. And in 2 Corinthians 9.13 this fellowship is talked about in the sense of a liberal sharing, depending on what translation you use. And that's a sharing of whatever need the saints have, we liberally share to take care of that. And then it says in 2 Corinthians 13, uh, 14, about the fellowship of the Holy Spirit be, being with you all. <coughs> <clears throat> Excuse me, amen. So we fellowship in the Holy Spirit. We fellowship in Christ. We fellowship in God. In fact, there are times, Galatians 2 9, where we're given the right hand of fellowship. The whole idea of fellowship is, it's a, as I said earlier, it's a participation. We have been brought into this participating with God and with Christ and with the Holy Spirit and that just like uh, we have come together and maybe we haven't shaken right hands particularly but just the fact that we have come together this week as we have we're giving each other the right hand of fellowship because we've come together so, so remember that and I think one of the main passages about fellowship, uh, 1 John uh, chapter, chapter 1, I want to turn to that real quick and, and read that. You can turn to it also. 1 John. Okay, all right. Um, here in 1 John uh, chapter 3, six and seven fellowship is is talked about there so so keep that in mind it's a fellowship with christ uh, i'll go ahead and stop there uh, so i hope this has been fruitful it's been helpful uh, thank thank you